<laughs> Are we almost, we're almost at the cabin. Just got a little ways to go. This is going to be one of my spring projects. I'm going to have to um, chop this up and we'll dry it out. You can usually use this. If you chop it, you have to wait about a year before it fully dries. It's ide ideally two years. So I'll, I'll get this chopped up um, sometime this spring or summer. Come on, bud. Let's go. Christopher and welcome to another episode of the Cabin Boy Knits Woolcast. In this episode I'm going to take you on a journey. We're actually going to do two journeys. The first one is going to be back into my property in the forest and we're going to be looking for juniper and birch bark. I'll also talk about uh, some of the wildlife that lives in the forest as well. The second journey we're going to go way back in time to the mid 1600s. I went back into the Canadian archives and I went through a lot of information because I was trying to figure out which sheep actually lived in this cabin. When I purchased the cabin, I was told that sheep lived here at one period of time. And so I'm guessing it's probably in the eight, late 1800s. So we'll go and look at that. The journey is gonna take us through um, to the UK, over to the United States, to France. Um, I, and we're also gonna happen upon characters like George Washington and Charles Darwin. So it was, it was a great, it was a lot of fun for me to, to research this. Um, spring is here, it's a fantastic time of year and a lot of the festivals have started. And so I attended a festival a couple weeks ago with my daughter and I want to talk about that and some of the great yarn I picked up. And then in the last episode, I showed you my indigo dyeing and I want to show you the end result. I've got a bunch of skeins to show you. I mix the indigo with um, Brazil wood and also with marigold and then I'll show you some just straight indigo as well. So I had a lot of fun doing that and I'm looking forward to showing that to you. So grab your favorite drink um, sit back and I will share my wool story. I'm off to pick up juniper and birch bark. We, I'm going to make a dye pot this afternoon and so I want to get some fresh juniper and also some fresh birch bark right off the ground. Um, so I'm going to head out with Zan to, to get that. You notice that today is overcast and if this is a typical spring day in Canada. One day it's beautiful warm and sunny like yesterday I was out knitting on uh, the, the back porch and you know it was, it was so nice and warm to sit underneath the sun didn't have a lot on uh, when I was knitting because it was just it was just so warm today it's it's a much colder and I've got a sweater on and I've got my coveralls on um, I'm also wearing the coveralls for another reason because it's above zero the ticks might come out and so I want to make sure that I don't have any skin exposed to um, to attract the ticks so I've got my coveralls on and then if you look down at my boots I've got uh, I've got my pants tucked into my socks just to, to protect myself. So when I come back, I'll be checking the dog and checking myself to make sure I don't have any ticks. Anyway, why don't we um, head off into the forest and get some juniper and birch. Dan, let's go. You'll notice that in this forest there are a lot of fallen trees and that's because the soil is very sandy and so uh, the trees some of them make it and and grow to be quite large we've actually got a tree uh, just over here which is over 250 years old but a lot of them don't make it to that age just because uh, again the sand is um, is very sand the ground is very sandy and the trees topple over so um, but there's it's very healthy forest
Zan, come. Come. Come here. This is an example of a lot of the birch that we have around here. And so there's a lot of fallen birch. So this is a good area to, to pick some birch from. And also right in front of it, we've got horsetail. We've got tons of horsetail. And horsetail is fantastic for dyeing. That's definitely a springtime uh, dye bath for me. Uh, I love seeing the horsetail and there's tons of it around here. This is actually one of the oldest uh, plants on, on earth. It's been around, it's been around forever. Uh, Looks like Zan's found the juniper. We've got some juniper over here, right where Zan is sitting or standing, running around. We've got some right here as well. I'm gonna actually go over here and, and get some. This is, I've picked from this place before. And I actually boil uh, the whole the whole thing. I take I boil the stem as well as the berries and as well as the the needles. You should you wear gloves when you're doing this because it it does get prickly. So I'm gonna put on my gloves. Um, I forget that, and then every time my fingers are pricked, um, I realize I should wear my gloves. You can also see the wild grape stained the gloves as well. Zan, are you going to help me? Mm, it smells so nice. And I love springtime because this you can just smell spring. It, it's such a wonderful scent. In a couple of weeks, we'll start to see the ground getting green. This also smells wonderful in the dye pot. And I like to get a, a full bag of juniper because, and I just pack that in the dye pot and then I add water to it and let it simmer for an afternoon. And the scent is fantastic. In this dye pot this afternoon, I'm gonna be putting birch bark birch bark and juniper in together. Just a few more. Actually, I'm going to take some over in the other bush. I'm not going to... That's enough from this one. Come on, Dan. Let's go. Come on. has lots of berries on it as well. Set. It's an 
enough for my pot. Now on to get some birch bark. Come on, bud. Okay, over here we have a yellow birch. And this is fascinating. Look at all the different fungi um, attached to it. And also, in, when you're sit sitting out in the, sometimes when I'm sitting out in the morning having coffee, I can hear the woodpeckers. It's so loud some days. It's, it's, it's one, quite incredible. Um, and you can see this is, this is referred to now as a pecker post. And it's a pecker post because the woodpeckers love it. And they have been pecking in here. They've been pecking in here. And then on this side, it's huge. They've done done a lot of a lot of damage um, and looking for insects. So they're basically going at it to, to look for insects. And there's there's all different woodpeckers here. We've definitely got pileated woodpeckers as well, and they're about this big. They're huge. Um, that's that's a lot. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous tree. Absolutely beautiful. All the life on it too. It's really really nice. I'm gonna cross the river, and it looks like I'm gonna have to give the dog a bath when I get back. He is covered in mud. Oh well, he's having fun. So this is a little tree. The pond that I passed um, earlier, this stream is, is stemming from the pond. And it runs all the way through through my property. Zan is at my, my favorite tree. Zan is at my favorite tree in the, in the in the woods. This tree is 250 years old. So every time I come near it, I always give it a hug. Beautiful, a beautiful oak tree. We also get a lot of winds around here and I've noticed, especially over the last year, the tops of some of the trees have just blown off, which, uh, and, and some and some oak trees, like top of some of the oak trees, and oak trees are, are pretty strong. Uh, so I'm really surprised with that. So we're off to get some birch. Zan, let's go. Come on. I found another birch pile, so I'm going to start picking some birch off the ground. Birch bark is, is wonderful. The indigenous people of Canada had a lot of uses for, for birch bark. Um, one of the things that they actually used to do with birch bark was remove cataracts. Uh, can you imagine that, using birch bark to remove cataracts? They also make canoes. Canoes have been a huge, very, very important part of Canadian history. I'll also take this birch bark that still has wood inside of it, and when I boil this, uh, the skin easily slips off. So um, I don't bother doing that. Like I'll do that after I put it in the pot. You see that the deer have been here. They've left their mark. So they probably, well, I don't think they slept here because it's not. It's, it's more difficult to tell though in the spring whether or not they have. It's easy to tell in the winter because in the winter time, I'll see uh, a big area where they've where they've slept. But this is a good indication that, they, that they're around. There's a lot of deer in this forest. There's bear, deer, coyotes, fox, skunks, um, raccoons, 
lots of squirrels. Another marking I wanted to point out was this is called the red stripe tree. Actually it's not. It's it's just a regular tree. The red mark on it is just to talk about the property line between my property and the neighbor's property. And I've got them going to, I'm on 17 acres so it goes way back um, and then it goes all the way over to a conservation area which is uh, which is right beside right beside the property. I've got all the birch bark I need, so I'm going to head back to the cabin and get a dye pot going. Last week I did a lot of dyeing, a lot of dyeing with indigo and marigold and Brazil wood. And so I showed you my dye pot of indigo dye and Brazil wood and I want to this episode show you what came out of the dye pot. So the first one I want to show you is the indigo. And the wool that I used for this one is a mixture of Canadian wool. I put this in several times. So I probably used about three or four dips and that's why you see such a dark blue. Um, I really like this dark blue. I still got the string on it because it's, I haven't finished washing it yet. Um, so th that should be ready um, probably by the end of today. This is Shetland wool and the Shetland wool went in, I did two dips on this one. So you can see that it's considerably lighter than the than the darker one than the mixed wool um, but again this is a this is a, a lovely a lovely blue so very happy with the outcome this is also Shetland wool and this was a gray skein that I used in it and so I used um, just it was just straight uh, it was this strand of or skein of Shetland wool and my indigo dye pot and this had two dips and then the fun um, started when I started mixing marigold. So I have this one has marigold in it, and you can see I did two dips of of the blue indigo as well. Um, so you know, it's it's still it's nice and squishy, and and I, I love the color. I think it's terrific. This is also indigo and marigold, and so this one I dipped the the marigold first, and then the indigo second and it came out a nice a nice green color. This is Blue Faced Lester, and the Blue Faced Lester did the same process. So you can see they're slightly different color, um, and they take the take the dye differently as well. Um, so this is, I've got, I think I've got, I'm gonna put, probably put this one in one more time in the indigo, but it's, it's nice, soft, squishy, and this is still in process. It hasn't been finished yet. Now this one, believe it or not, is the same. It's a Blue Faced Lester, and I just changed the, I mixed it up and I used, uh, I put this firstly in the indigo and then secondly in the, in the marigold. So you can see they're quite different color in each of them. This is a sock yarn and it's Blue Faced Lester. And I think we I have 20% nylon in it as well. Um, so it's, I, I like really happy with this. This is indigo and um, Brazil wood. So um, a lot of great colors that came out of that. This is Shetland and in the Shetland wool, um, I used a gray skein and so that's, that's the outcome of the Shetland wool and I used um, indigo in this and also Brazil wood. This one had pretty much everything in it. It has um, indigo and it has Brazil wood and it has marigold and this one is also 
um, um, BFL, and it's it's sock yarn as well. So um, that's a quite a nice color. It's very soft pastel colors. Looks a lot different than some of the others. Um, it's quite nice. And then the last two are Brazil wood. Wanted to show you these. We've got two different types of wool. I have the Shetland wool and the BFL. And this one actually had two dips. And so I put it in the first time, took it out, and then put it back in again. And so I've got this nice um, scarlet red that came out of it. This was actually in the last episode. It was hanging above the, the dye pods um, when I was doing work in the kitchen last week. And then this is just a lighter version of it, and this is on the Shetland wool. So, you know, I was really happy with the outcome. I've got, I did uh, so much. I think I've got about 50 skeins in, in various um, stages of, of being done. So it was a very busy week last week, and then I was just tidying up this weekend. So very happy to show that to you, uh, and I was happy with the results as well. I mentioned a second journey, and this was such a fun trip for me. Uh, it was actually, I didn't leave, have to leave the cabin, it was through the archives, the Canadian archives. And I was trying to figure out, you know, which breed of sheep actually um, lived in this cabin at one time. And if you can see the picture right here, hopefully the glare is not too bright on it. But the cabin that I'm sitting in right now is, is this one. And so the way, I guess the way that the, ca the cabin is configured today is I've got two cabins that were uh, originally built probably around 100 kilometers from here or 60 miles and um, they were taken apart one by one and then rebuilt on this site so I've got uh, one cabin and there are two cabins and they're perpendicular to one another so, but this is the sheep cabin or I was told that this is the one that she, the sheep lived in um, and I'm guessing that because the cabins were built in the 1850s it's probably likely or highly likely that the sheep were um, probably living here maybe in the late 1800s. So I thought, okay, how am I gonna figure out, is it possible to figure out the breed of sheep that actually lived here? And so I went back into the archives, the Canadian archives to try to figure that out and read that the first sheep that arrived in Canada was in the mid 1600s and they came from France and they lived in Acadia. So Acadia was the first area within Canada that had sheep in the mid 1600s. And for those of you that are not as familiar with Canada, if we think that this is British Columbia, and this is Newfoundland over here, so this is our east coast and this is our west coast, and Acadia is over here. And so that's where the, the first sheep would have, would have been. The cabin right now is, Ontario's right around here, and that's, that's where I am. The sheep are over here. And so then after that, uh, more sheep came over from France, and they settled in Quebec. And then the populations grew and grew and grew. Um, into the, from the mid-1600s to the 1700s. And it wasn't until the 1800s that um, sheep started coming in and filling up other areas uh, within Ontario, for example, and, and two key um, activities went on at that time. One was a, a huge immigration um, boom from the United Kingdom. And we had a number of people move in to Canada from the United Kingdom and they brought their sheep with them. And they brought Cotswold and um, Lincoln um, and Lester Longwools, uh, Southampton. So there were a number of a number of sheep that came in with them, and so that was one uh, population influx. And the other one was there was a migration from the United States into Canada as well. And that group of people were called the United Empire Loyalists. And during that period of time, and the United States um, basically. Um, separated from the United Kingdom and so the people that were supporting the crown um, decided that you know it probably isn't the best place for us to stick around so they migrated and came to Canada and so I'm guessing that this cabin well this cabin was located in an area called Upper Canada um, close to our nation capital and if you go back to my our map and we think about Toronto's right here and Montreal's right here and so along here would be the St. Lawrence River and the United States is down here. So we've got Toronto here, Montreal here, and Ottawa, would, our capital city, would be right around here. And that's where this cabin is from. So I'm thinking that um, the, the sheep that came over, to, over into Acadia and, um, and Quebec um, were primarily Cheviot sheep. And so um, Cheviot sheep could have or may have been um, in Ontario as well at the time. Well, they probably were, but not into 
around when we think about the late 1800s, um, the sheep that were coming from the UK and the US um, predominantly uh, took over and um, were in, in significant or greater numbers. And so I started looking through the archives and trying to figure out, okay, well, in terms of population, um, which one, which breed did we have the most of and where were they located? And when I started looking through the archives, it would say, you know, John Doe moved over, moved to Canada on such and such a date, and with him he brought four cattle and four sheep. So they didn't really explain the breed. So I thought, you know, this is going to be more challenging than I than I expected. And then I happened upon some documents that showed the results of local fairs. Um, and there, there's a couple of large fairs that were taking place. One was in New York, and um, there was another one in Toronto. And so I started to look at the winners of, or, or just the results, and it was great because they were able to show the number of sheep that were actually uh, participating in the fair. Um, and so that's not a um, not going to give me the exact um, sense of how many sheep that we actually had uh, per breed, but it did give me a sense of you know, how many were shown in, in these fairs. Uh, and then I uh, was fortunate enough to happen upon another document that actually explained or ta was talking about the most uh, prominent sheep in Ontario. And I think uh, when we look at the late 1800s, the most prominent sheep um, would have been the Lincoln Longwool and the Lester Longwool, but specifically the Lester Longwool. And so started looking at the Lester Longwool and trying to figure out, well, why were most of the sheep in um, Upper Canada at that period of time Lester Longwools? And that took me back to the UK and to a guy named Robert Bakewell. And Robert Bakewell was, had a huge impact on, um, on breeding. And um, he was breeding not only sheep, but horses as well. And he was so succe successful in his breeding, he was doing selective breeding. So basically he was taking the sheep and trying to figure out which, which were the best qualities of the sheep. Um, and so from a meat perspective, at that period of time, people liked fattier meat. And so he was um, breeding the sheep to have a, a fattier meat and then a more lustrous coat as well. And he became incredibly popular and the Lester Longwell became incredibly popular and um, it started showing up in uh, Australia, the United States, and in Canada as well. Um, and he was so successful that his selective breeding had a huge influence on, on how uh, people were breeding in the future, but also it was noted by Charles Darwin as well, and it, and it had an influence on Charles Darwin. And George Washington commented on it as well. Um, so, you know, very popular guy and had a huge impact on on farming, but also on livestock and the way that we see livestock today. Um, and so that um, caused a huge migration of, of, of this type of sheep all over the world. And so in Canada, it was by far the most popular sheep. Um, so we had the, a lot of the Cheviots in Acadia and in Quebec, and then we had uh, Lester Longwolves and Southampton sheep and Cotswold sheep in, in largely in Upper Canada. So that narrowed it down, I thought, um, so I was basically thinking, well, is it possible that it was Lester Longwell? And I'm assuming that these are all purebreds that are in that are in this cabin. Of course, they could have been a mixture. Um, but then it wasn't until I happened upon information in um, as a in, or basically the results of one of the ex exhibits or the exhibitions um, in Toronto. And in that exhibition, it had the category winners. Of, of sheep. So I started looking through that and I couldn't believe it. The winner of sheep breeding, um, or for the, I guess it was the most lust, um, lustrous coat, was a farmer named Chris Walker, which is my namesake. And I couldn't, could not believe it. Uh, so I will definitely put a link to that uh, Canadian Archive article because I was, I was floored. I, I, I thought it was too much of a coincidence, so I, th I thought it was um, quite amusing. But anyway, so I stopped my research there. Obviously, if my namesake in the 1800s is showing his sheep, um, we've got the same name that has to, and he's showing um, Lester Longwells, it has to be Lester Longwells that um, lived in this cabin. So that was the end of it. But it was it was a great it was a great uh, time to learn about the sheep in Canada and all the um, the connection to the various countries as well. So I had a lot of fun doing that. You know, spring is here 
and I love the smell of spring outside. Um, everyone seems to be in a, in a fantastic mood. And so it also kicks off the yarn festivals or a lot of yarn festivals. And I happened to go to one a couple of weeks ago with my daughter to a place, it's probably around an hour from here. And it's in a university town. And so um, I was looking at it and I was looking through the vendors because I always look through a list of the vendors to see um, who's going to be there. And there were a lot of vendors I had never heard of before. So, you know, I took that, I, that, I was really interested in that because when you think about it, it's only an hour away. I, I thought I knew most people. Um, so I was really excited to, to go and see it. And I'm glad I did because there was a lot of great things to, to see. Um, so I'm going to show you my haul. So I think it, it was quite successful. I, I went in with my daughter, we scoped the area out. I said, normally we do a, a circle, we go around the perimeter and check all, all the vendors out. And then we make a note of where we want to go back. And so that's what, that's what we did. It wasn't a huge festival, but it was great. It was perfect. Um, and they had a great selection of, of vendors there as well. I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled to happen upon the first vendor uh, who I know uh, quite well, Grace Claire. And Grace has fantastic, fantastic wool. Um, so her farm is Shepherd's Hill. And um, it's, you know, she's, she, her yarn is, is just incredible. Um, there's a large, a very large exhibition that takes place, it's the largest one in Canada, it takes place in Toronto. And her wool has uh, won uh, a number of years. So it, it's fantastic. It's um, definitely passes the squish test. And, and I just absolutely love it. I've actually bought a few of her skeins years ago in a yarn shop. It was set up, uh, all the metals around it and, and ribbons. Um, so I bought some of her yarn and I haven't knit with it yet because I just love touching it, looking at it. Um, so uh, one day, and I did share that story with, with uh, Grace Claire as well um, to let her know, but I will definitely knit with it at some point. But anyway, this is an example of it. This is um, Blue Face Lester and I think it's Cashmere as well. Uh, oh, mohair, pardon me. Mohair and blue face luster, and it's it's absolutely beautiful. I love it. Um, so I was looking around her, her booth and touching all of the yarn as we do when we go in, and I really liked this. There was something about this skein of yarn that spoke to me, and it was just because it was so different than all the others. This is a lopey um, style, and so it's you can see uh, the way it's spun and... Um, so I was looking at it and just thought, you know, this definitely has a different texture and it has character. This this skein of yarn definitely has character to it. And so I'm holding it and Grace is looking at me like, and she's got this bewildered look in her fa on her face. And she said to me, why did you pick that yarn? And so I told her, I said, well, it has character. Um, and I don't know, it just, it feels good. I like it. And she said, well, and this is actually uh, Border Luster as well, and it's 15% uh, Kid Mohair. Um, so you can see a little halo over it as well. And so she said, well, uh, there's a story to this yarn. Do you want to hear it? And I said, absolutely. I love, love hearing stories to the yarn. And so this was a ram, came from a ram named Patrick. And Patrick had an attitude. And I think he went after Grace Claire a couple of times. So, um, I don't think Patrick is still there on the farm, uh, but he definitely had a lot of character and a lot of chutzpah. And um, so, I'm not surprised that that uh, the characteristics of the of the ram uh, are definitely consistent with the, with this skein of yarn. So, I love this. I'm really really happy with this with this skein. The other thing I picked up was. Um, I wanted to get a couple of, I was gonna do some drop spinning, drop spinning um, with my drop spindle. And so I was looking um, around and so that was, uh, that was on my list as well. Um, and so this also came from Grace Claire. And it is, so we'll go through each of them. Uh, I have to put my glasses on to read this. So the white one is Cordale Blueface Lester, and that came from a sheep called Annie. This one is 
Well, any can be, yeah. And then the next one is BFL, um, and that came from Pearl. And then Cordell Romney came from Wendy. And then there's another BFL, um, Cordell at the bottom. So it's great. I love the color. It's natural, um, and it looks great. So I'm looking forward to, to spending that. The next one is I was attracted by a couple of things. One is the the way that this was just laid out. Um, I love Shetland wool, and this is Shetland. And part of the reason, one of the reasons I love Shetland is because you can get so many different colors coming from it. This is a better side. And it's really, really nice. But I wanted to read the, the card that came in it. Um, Shetland Shades 9 ounce sampler. Thank you for purchasing the Shetland Shades 9 ounce sampler. We've been working very hard to encourage diversity in our flock for colored fleeces. It is an ongoing process. We currently do not have all 11 Shetland fleece colors. So this sampler has been hand blended with our Shetland sheep wool to create beautiful gradation. This kit will give you the spinner an idea of all the different colors you can work with. Each shade is approximately one ounce and has been carded into mini bats ready for your spinning enjoyment. Happy spinning Jeremy and Rebecca Lambert. And they are from the Santasha Fiberworks and Farm and they're located in Little Britain. Um, yes there's a place called Little Britain in Ontario and so um, really happy with this. They did a great job of, of packaging this and showcasing uh, their natural fleece. So I was very excited to, to pick this up. So thanks guys for, for providing this um, great wool. I'm looking forward to spinning this as well. And then the last one is from Mostly Mohair. And this is absolutely lovely. It's, it's really nice. And this is, oh, this is funny. I was looking at the at the label for this one and I wanted to know what um, Norboulet is <laughs> because I'm very familiar with Ramboulet but I wasn't uh, familiar with Norboulet so it's actually a mixture um, of Ramboulet and Norfolk um, well and it's beautiful and there's also uh, mohair in this as well so it feels absolutely stunning really really nice so this is from mostly mohair and that farm is probably around half an hour from here. I, I just, you know, so thankful for this area and all the farmers in this area because they're really pulling out quality stuff. And it's a, it's a great area to visit um, to, to buy yarn. So I was really happy with it. So Peterborough, great job on, I think, I'm not sure if this was your first festival or not, but you did a terrific job and you had some great vendors there and I really had a great time uh, going there. I just wanted to comment on two things before I end the episode. One of them is I wanted to share with you what's making me happy this week. And, um, you know, I was not able to go to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. It is still on my list of places to visit. So hopefully next year I can make it there. Um, so I was living vicariously by watching some of the uh, YouTube uh, webcasts that were on. And I just wanted to thank um, Hey Brownberry for your coverage of it. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. It was great. I love the tone of, I think there were four episodes that you had plus an additional one. Um, just the, the tone of everything, the, the music that you picked and the shots. Like we really got a sense of your experience there. And so um, thanks for sharing that. And I encourage uh, everyone out there, if you haven't watched it already, um, go check out Hey Brownberry. I'll put a link to it as well, but I really enjoyed that. So that was the next best thing. Couldn't go this year, but um, you know, really enjoyed watching your your uh, coverage of it. It was it was terrific. And also, I wanted to mention the last thing is I just wanted to thank everybody for all of the feedback that you've been giving me um, through each episode. When I'm doing this, I don't you, I don't ever think about you know where are you when you're watching this. Um, so I got a lot of great photos from people on where they were uh, watching this either. You know, lying in bed watching it or um, on an elliptical or on a Stairmaster. It was just, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. So thanks for your questions and thanks for all the photos that you've been sending me. I really appreciate it. And I just wish everyone a, a, a great week and I look forward to talking to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.
I mentioned that there's a, a lot of wildlife in here and here's an example of it. This actually I think was from, from last year. It looked like there was a pack of coyotes or, or wolves who uh, had a unfortunate deer for, for dinner. I'm actually going to take these because Zan will start chewing on them so I'm going to take these and put them somewhere else. But this is only maybe a hundred meters away from the from the cabin. 